Is that accurate? Have I been saying February this whole time? Incorrect. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Trime. Crew Trime. Crew Trime. If you are new here, hello. <laughs> my name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if that sounds like fun to you, you're in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe to this channel, hit the bell notification, and then that way you will never miss one of my terrible stories. So we're continuing our terrible tour of the United States and today's story takes us to the location where the largest and most complete skeleton of a Tyrannosaurus Rex was found on earth. That's a big deal. You see what I did there? <laughs> it's also the home of the Mitchell Corn Palace and what's considered like the epicenter of the American Wild West. The Black Hills, the Badlands, Deadwood. We're going to South Dakota. Before we get too far into today's story, let's talk to future me about today's sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by NordVPN. So my internet history is concerning. I have to look up a lot of murdery things in the name of science and it's all perfectly innocent. I'm just searching for things like most disturbing murders in American history. How many dead bodies are found in barrels every year? Peanut butter baby grunt. Uh. Anyway, NordVPN keeps it cool, man. And if I'm poking around and I find a website that's like blocked in my country, boop. VPN. It redirects me to a server from another country and then I can keep creeping around. I mean browse without any issues. But that's not all because sometimes the websites that I click on are a little sketchy. You know, they've got these weird ads on the sides or they have these fake, you have a virus alert. Don't click those, okay? It's a trap. Anyway, NordVPN protects against those things without slowing down my connection and it keeps my location hidden so I don't get those weird targeted ads. My data is secure and it keeps my browsing history where it belongs, in my weird mind. Visit nordvpn.com slash goblin to check out the exclusive two-year deal risk-free that includes four free bonus months and a 30-day money-back guarantee. I'll link it right up top in the description box and I'll also put it in the pinned comment to make it really easy for you, but do yourself a favor and get safe online with NordVPN. Thank you, future me. So where are we? South Dakota. This is the story of Robert Leroy Anderson. Let's secure these bangs. On July 29th, 1996, Piper Striley of Canastota, South Dakota, mother to Shana and Nathan, wife to Vance, disappeared, never to be seen again. At the time, Piper was actually working for Southeastern Mental Health Outreach, and she was a home assistance worker. She spent every evening taking care of a mother and son that had disabilities. Well, Piper was known to be very reliable and trustworthy. So when she didn't show up as scheduled at her 3 p.m. shift, the client called her employers who immediately called her house to see if they could reach her. Also, Piper would typically take her three-year-old daughter, Shayna, and two-year-old son, Nathan, to daycare before she headed to work. Okay, so it's like 1996. So cell phones were like not really a thing unless it was like one of those giant bag phones or something mounted in your car. So the point is it was a little bit more difficult at that time to reach somebody. All right, so Piper's supervisor, Patty Lynn Sinclair, called the Striley house, but it went straight to the answering machine. You guys remember those, right? Well, she hung up and called right back, but this time uh, it was answered, but it was her three-year-old daughter, Shayna. Well, Patty Lynn asked, you know, is your mommy or daddy home? And Shayna said, no. She asked, okay, well, can I talk to the babysitter? And she's like, no, a mean man carried mommy away. What? Okay, so Patty asked Shayna, you know, when, when did mommy leave? And Shayna said, a while ago, she left with a mean man in a black car. Patty asked, um, do you know the man? Well, Shayna was crying this whole time, you know, and she was just saying things like, I don't want mommy to die. I don't want daddy to die. Like, there's a lot. The point is, Patty was trying to keep Shayna on the phone until help could arrive at the house. 
So Sheriff Jean Taylor of McCook County arrived at the Striley house at 5.09 p.m. to perform a welfare check on the children. When he approached the home, he could see that there were some initial signs of a struggle that might have occurred there. The steps were broken, the front door was gaping open, and once inside, there was definitely something amiss. The majority of the inside of the house was, you know, tidy and orderly, but there was, you know, a chair knocked over, an ironing board knocked over, like something happened in there. Also, a lady's handbag had been like dumped out all over the floor. In the hallway leading to the back bedroom, he found little Shayna. She was crying and very shaken. And eventually Nathan came out too. They were unharmed physically, but you know, very upset. Shayna just continued crying, you know, saying a bad man and a black truck came. There was a loud noise and mommy told me and Nathan to hide. Well, Piper's husband, Vance Striley, called a few minutes later and the sheriff told him that the kids were okay, but you need to get home right now. When Vance got there, they kept him away from the house at first because, I mean, obviously he was a suspect. When Shayna realized that her daddy was there, you know, she went running to him and she was just going on and on about the mean man that took mommy away. And after seeing Shayna react in that way, they figured he's not responsible. And they also did verify that Vance had a solid alibi. He had been at work. So Piper Striley was born in Ohio on February 11th, 1968 to John and Jean Potts. She had three brothers. They eventually all moved to Rio Medina, Texas around the time that she'd started high school. Piper was always involved. You know, she was a member of the flag team and she played clarinet in the band. And after high school graduation, she decided to go to Canyon View Bible School in Silverton, Oregon. This is where she would meet her eventual husband, Vance. Murray, what? Vance was a South Dakota native and it was love at first sight. So Piper and Vance had a lot in common. You know, they were very strong in their faith and they both dreamed of one day opening a church and they wanted to work with kids and organize like a summer Bible camp. In 1989, they were married. You know, they eventually had two children and then they settled down on a 40 acre lot of land in Canastota, South Dakota. This is where they had planned to open their Bible camp and they were working toward it, you know, they bought like a small bus that they were gonna use to pick up and drop off kids each day. And they offered arts and crafts and archery and swimming and all of that, all of that. Well, most of the year, Vance worked as a plumber and Piper, as I mentioned, was a home assistance worker, except for in the summer in July when they did the summer camp thing. Prior to all of that, Piper and Vance had also both worked at John Morrell's, or Morrell's, a local meatpacking plant. Just file that away for later. Back to the investigation. So the McCook County investigators tried questioning both Vance and Shayna, but there really wasn't much else that they were gonna get out of this three-year-old girl. They declared the home a crime scene and they had a forensics team come out and process the area. What they figured out was that when Vance left for work that morning at 6.30, he told Piper that he would check in with her around noon. However, when he called, she didn't answer. Later that morning, Piper did call the daycare to confirm that she was planning to bring the kids, but then she never showed up. So the home didn't really yield that much obvious evidence other than the struggle, but police did find a nine millimeter bullet casing in the driveway. Police set up roadblocks and, you know, tried to stop people that were driving by to get any kind of information that they could. One person that was driving a road grader in the area said that he had seen a black Ford Bronco with a CB antenna mounted on it. He said he saw it go down the road toward the Striley house twice that day once earlier in the morning around 9 45 and then it returned back by him an hour later and then the same thing like two hours later another neighbor reported seeing a ford bronco parked at the striley house twice that day later that evening with the kids at his parents house that night vance remembered something important immediately and he called up one of the agents working piper's case he said that on the friday before all this happened a man actually came to their house he said that it was early in the morning when the man knocked on the door and Vance answered and the guy seemed like surprised to see him. But Vance shook his hand. He said it was like the most limp noodle dead fish handshake ever. I better use my strong hand. 
The man said that his name was Robert Anderson and he was actually interested in the summer camp. He said that he had four children, aged four, three, two, and one, and he was just really interested in what the camp had to offer. Well, Vance told him that, you know, the kids had to be at least five years old to attend the camp. And furthermore, it was only open during the summertime. So Piper came out from the back room and offered the man a pen and paper to write down his information so that they could add him to their newsletter, you know, for more information once the kids got a little bit older. So this odd man that had come to the house before actually drove a Ford Bronco. So maybe that could be the car that Shayna had been describing. Anyways, well, the investigators were still at the Stryley house looking for evidence. So Vance came back to try to look for that slip of paper but couldn't find it anywhere. Vance said that he remembered the man said his name was Robert Anderson because that's his grandpa's name. And the man said he had also been staying at Doc Schaefer's house close to Lake Vermilion. Well, the lead investigator was familiar with everyone who lived at Lake Vermilion. He said that there was an Anderson staying there, but his name was Leland. So he went out to the house to speak to this person and the guy's mother answered the door and said he was at work at Morell's meatpacking plant. Investigators contacted Morell's and found out that there was a Robert Leroy Anderson that worked the night shift, like 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. When they arrived at the meatpacking plant, they found the man's vehicle. It was a Ford Bronco. The license plates matched up with what they pulled from public records, but the Bronco wasn't black. It was blue and it had like custom designs painted down the sides. That's something that you would remember. Well, the person that gave the tip about seeing the Bronco confirmed that, you know, that custom paint job was not at all what he saw. And they had no evidence on this man other than the connection of working at Morell's, but they did keep a surveillance, like a tail on that Bronco. You know, when Robert Anderson left work, they followed him home. So an investigator came to Anderson's home and asked him to come down to the police station to answer some questions. You know, they wanted to rule him out, of course, and he agreed. You know, this mid-twenties, balding, chubby white guy ended up in an interview with police for like eight hours. They never formally charged him or even really accused him of anything. But in the beginning, he said that he didn't know Piper, had never met Piper, but then he changed his story and said that, oh yeah, he did go to the Stryley's house on Friday the 26th to ask about summer camp for the kids. But he completely denied being at her house on the 29th. Oh, but then he remembered that he actually did return to the Stryleys on the 29th to see about, you know, using the archery range. But when he knocked on the door, nobody answered. Okay, so police got a copy of Anderson's driver's license and they included it in a photo array for both Vance and Shayna to look at and nobody, neither of them recognized him from the photos. Well, the problem is, you know, that driver's license photo that they used featured a much younger Robert Leroy Anderson with like longer hair. He looked totally different. Well, once they used their brains, <laughs> and got a better photograph, a more recent photograph, Vance and Shayna separately both identified this man as the person who had come to the house. And in Shayna's case, she was pointing out the mean man who took mommy. Okay, so after being positively ID'd in the photos, police were able to, you know, issue search warrants for Anderson's Bronco and his house and body. And by the way, you know, for somebody who had been held that long in like a police interrogation and had searches issued to his home and property, Robert Anderson did not seem bothered at all. Okay, also important little nugget that will become very important later, Robert was a sexual sadist. No shade to people who enjoy, you know, creative bedroom antics, but a sexual sadist, it, that's different, okay? That's somebody who gets like gratification, excitement from like the pain of other people, particularly non-consenting people. Army hammer. They go, what? This is a disturbance, okay? Not an interest. Well, Anderson, they later learned, had spent a lot of his life telling all of his friends about these fantasies that he had about kidnapping and raping and killing women. So back to the search of his home. So during this search, 
of his home, they didn't really find much in the way of evidence, but they did find a pair of jeans that had a blood stain on them, and this was later determined to be Piper's blood. I mean, obviously they didn't know it at the time that these were discovered, but at any rate, the house was pretty much clear, but the Bronco, different story. So Robert Leroy Anderson was, you know, a bit of a hoarder, a collector, I guess. They found a ton of receipts on the floorboard and passenger side of, you know, the car, and they were dated over the last few months. And it was receipts for all sorts of things, but you know, they definitely looked at all of them and they noticed that there was a receipt for gloves, household sprayers, a bucket, a paintbrush, craft paint. And some of those receipts were were dated, you know, just like days before Piper disappeared. So of course, you know, they pulled on that thread and went to the hardware store of one of those receipts and they talked to the sales clerk. They first showed the clerk a, a photograph, a recent photograph of Robert Anderson. You know, she recognized this person and remembered that he had come into the store looking for like water soluble paint. He explained that he wanted to play a prank on his friend, you know, where he would paint his friend's truck black as a joke. Ha 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 ha. I wish somebody would try to paint my truck black as a joke. Cut you. Anyways, the point is because it was a prank, he wanted to make sure that the paint would easily wash off. It's very interesting. So when police looked a little closer at the exterior of his Ford Bronco, there was still drips of that same black craft paint on the car. Anderson was not playing pranks on people. He was using that paint to cover up his own car, that custom paint job. Also, and this is disturbing, you know, the back seats of the Bronco had been removed and instead he had like a carpeted platform that perfectly fit in that area that had like eye rings in the corners and straps and tie down things. They called it a bondage board. Stuck to it was some cloth and hair and blood. And they later matched all that to Piper. They also went through his toolboxes attached to the back of the Bronco. And the first one held all of the normal things that you would expect, but the second toolbox, totally different. It had a tear gas container, nylon straps, and nine feet of chain. Also inside was an X-Acto knife, eye bolts, small pieces of some unknown plant material, and several quarter inch dowels cut into like nine inch lengths. They called this his torture box. Well, they sent the evidence to the crime lab for processing and sent that plant material to the South Dakota University. The South Dakota University? Anyways, they sent it to a university to be analyzed. So while they're waiting for all of that to come back, remember they don't they don't know any of this information that I just shared, like the blood and the hair, who it matches and the plant material. Anyways, while they're waiting, they mounted an exhaustive search for Piper. Volunteers came out in droves. They had people on horseback, they used dogs, boats, helicopters, all of it. You know, there was like 500 people that came out, including the governor of South Dakota. They were searching all of these marshes and boggy areas, but all they ended up finding was like leaves and ticks. Well, they were specifically searching the town of Montrose and the area around Lake Vermilion because that's where that black SUV had been seen. So the plant material, remember? When the analysis was completed, they found that they were searching in the wrong area. So Dr. Gary Larson from South Dakota University, the botany department, explained to them that that specific plant material came from black snake root and honewort, which wasn't found in the Lake Vermilion area, they should be looking around the Big Sioux River. Okay, so they shifted the search to that area using like a grid pattern and what they found was a lot. They found a battery operated a vibrator, a candle, some torn clothing, and duct tape. Lots of duct tape. Strips of it, wadded up pieces of it, and there was also hairs attached to the tape. Well, that the piece of shirt that they discovered, the pattern, it was like a black and white striped pattern and it actually matched the shirt that Piper was last seen wearing. With all of that, they determined that, you know, this was not 
likely gonna be a rescue at this point, it was gonna be a recovery. So when that evidence was all examined, it was found that the torn edges of that duct tape precisely matched portions of duct tape that had been pulled out of Anderson's Bronco. In the back of Anderson's truck, matched up perfectly with some other strands of duct tape that investigators found in an area by the Big Sioux River south of Baltic, where a piece of Striley's shirt was found. It was the big break in the case they needed. And they also determined that that candle and vibrator had been used to assault Piper. So later, they also were able to recover the other half of that t-shirt. You know, it had obviously been cut off of whoever had been wearing it last. All right, so who the hell is this Robert Leroy Anderson? Glad you asked. Well, he was born on December 4th, 1969 in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. He had two older brothers and a younger sister. He was a good student in school and he even studied in the gifted and talented program. But as you can imagine, his home life was a bit dysfunctional. His older brother, Billy, actually served prison time for manslaughter and his other brother, Lee, served prison time for attacking and, and stabbing a family. Robert did have close friendships from school, specifically a guy named Glenn Walker. They kind of grew up together, you know, and Glenn's family at one point moved away to Texas. And it was like the beginning of their junior year of high school and Robert moved with them. So Glenn and Robert were BFFs and they shared their deepest secrets with each other. Murray, what? Murray's mad because I'm in his seat. Murray, what precious? He is so mad, this is his seat. He likes to nap in my chair. So Glenn said that as far back as he could remember, like even to junior high school, Robert was always talking about wanting to kidnap and kill a woman. Well, Glenn just kind of blew this off, you know, thinking that it was just guy talk. Uh, ex excuse me, guy talk? What guys are talking about killing and raping women? Anyways, the point is Robert had been obsessed with these sick fantasies, you know, for most of his life. And that means he had spent a lot of time thinking about it and making plans. Part of his plan involved setting booby traps on roads. Booby traps, that's what I said, Sam, setting booby traps in case of anybody's following us. Like if we told us so we can hear them coming. So he had fashioned like pieces of metal, like sharp, things that would puncture tires. He called them tire poppers, creative. The idea was that he'd put them out in the road or wherever and a woman driving a car would drive over them and it would make the tire go flat so that she would have to pull over to handle it and then he could pop out. Demented. Okay, so let's back it up just a little bit. Pretty quickly, actually, after Piper disappeared, that eyewitness evidence the combination of evidence gathered and the eyewitness accounts, the, those statements led investigators to Robert Anderson and they arrested him for the kidnapping of Piper Striley. At this point, there's no body, so there's no murder. On April 8th, 1997, Robert Anderson's trial began at the McCook County Courthouse. The state brought in two of Robert's former friends to testify, and this really laid the foundation for Robert's personality. You know, they had known him since they were kids, and they knew about his obsession with kidnapping women. One of the witnesses, Jamie Hammer, worked at Morell's meatpacking plant. I guess everybody did. Well, Robert convinced Jamie to help him carry out one of his plans. You know, with the tire poppers and all that. Once Jamie saw that it was like, not just talk, he chickened out. The other witness was Glenn Walker, Robert's childhood friend. He said that Piper wasn't Robert's first or second victim. So apparently back in 1994, two years before Piper's disappearance, Robert and Glenn had been doing the same thing driving around all night, talking about abducting women. Well, Robert started talking about an actual woman named Larissa Dumansky that worked with them at Morell's. 
he told Glenn that he had been testing those tire poppers and they worked. The problem is when Larissa's tires would go flat as she was driving, she wouldn't just pull over anywhere, you know? She would keep going until there was more people around to help. So in the early 90s, Bill and Larissa Dumansky had immigrated to the United States from Kiev, Ukraine. So things in Ukraine weren't great for the Dumansky family and they actually had family. The rest of Bill's family had already moved to the United States in South Dakota. So Larissa and Bill actually qualified for asylum and they packed up their two young daughters and moved to America. First, both Bill and Larissa worked at Morell's. This place must have been like a major employer for the town anyways. Bill later went to work for like a carpet laying business, but Larissa kept working the night shift. On the morning of August 27th, 1994, when Bill woke up that morning, uh, usually Larissa was already home from work, but she hadn't made it home from the night before. Her shift typically ended around 1 a.m. and by this time it's like, seven. So Bill went down to Morell's and he actually found her car in the parking lot. He assumed that, you know, she had probably just gotten another flat tire. She had been having a lot of trouble with flat tires over the last couple weeks. Sure enough, it had a flat, but what was weird was that her car keys were still hanging from the door like the lock. Well, he went inside to find her, but she wasn't there and nobody had seen her. He called the police. So the local sheriff came out to investigate and they took Bill's statement. They were squinting at him, you know, he was their number one suspect. Well, he told them all about this rash of flat tires that had been happening in recent weeks, I guess. And he said that twice, at least to him, it looked like somebody from Morell's was doing it. Well, the police weren't really buying this story, unfortunately, so they took that tire to a mechanic to look at it and they agreed that there's no reason that this tire should be going flat unless somebody was messing with it. Well, over the next few days, they were able to clear Bill, you know, he had a solid alibi, and they started searching for Larissa. Oh, by the way, Larissa, at the time that she disappeared, was six weeks pregnant. So she obviously didn't just run away either. You know, at this time, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, had a very low crime rate. It was a really nice place to live. Well, lots of people joined the search, you know, they were trying to help find this woman. They used, again, helicopters and dogs and people went out on horseback and even on foot. Between Bill and Larissa's jobs, they even raised a reward fund like $8,000. Okay, so let's go back to the trial for Piper's kidnapping. So Glenn Walker, Robert's friend, said that because the tire poppers weren't working the way that Robert wanted for Larissa, he decided he was just gonna abduct her from work. So remember, this is two years before, so at this time, Robert didn't have that Bronco. He had a Monte Carlo. At 1 a.m. on August 27th, 1994, when Larissa Dumansky's shift ended and she came out to drive home, she didn't notice that her tire was flat. She was actually unlocking her car door to get in when Robert appeared from behind, attacking her, holding a knife to her neck. He threw her to the ground, held her down, and Glenn put duct tape across her mouth and bound her hands with it. Then they tossed her in the trunk of Robert's car and drove away. Okay, so now now, Glenn has two different versions of what happened next, so you can decide for yourself. But in one account, Glenn said that when driving to the secluded location they had picked, he panicked and demanded for Robert to let him out, take him home. And Robert was fine with that because all he needed Glenn for was that initial kidnapping. Well, the second version of the story, and it's more likely that this is what really happened, if you ask me, Glenn rode out to a secluded area with Robert and watched while Robert raped and murdered Larissa. By the way, Glenn was able to describe and lead police to the area where Larissa's body was buried. He claims it was because, you know, he was there for all that driving around and planning, but Okay, Robert had actually covered Larissa's head with duct tape. Remember, he's a sadist. So for him, the fear, pain, and terror are like 
how he gets his jollies. So he repeatedly assaulted her and she actually slowly suffocated. After this, he and Glenn buried her in a shallow grave under a chokeberry bush and it was like way under it so nobody would know that it was there. Glenn also told them about the attempted abduction of another girl named Amy. Amy who? Okay, so after the success of Larissa's abduction, Robert kept planning, you know, and he always wanted more. He had convinced Glenn that these were just random women, but that was not the case. So he targeted Amy Anderson, oh, no relation to Robert Anderson. She actually worked at a brokerage firm that Robert sometimes had some kind of business with. Anyways, so on November 10th, 1994, he and Glenn followed Amy as she went to dinner with a girlfriend of hers. And while at the restaurant, Robert put a tire popper under, you know, the tire of her car. So after they left, you know, Amy was driving her friend home. She noticed that her tire was weird. Something was going on, but she got her friend home and then she was just gonna stop to put some air in the tire. Well, by the time she was able to pull over and deal with that tire, it was like totally totally flat and she got out to change the tire herself. So while she was driving, Amy did notice that there was this Monte Carlo that was kind of lurking about and when she pulled over, it pulled over too, to help. She did notice that there was two passengers inside the car and it just she just got a bad feeling, you know? So as she went around to the back, of her car to get the jack so that she could deal with this tire, one of the men appeared and grabbed her from behind. As he tried to like drag her off into the woods, she broke free, ran into the road and flagged down a car to help her. It worked, she got away. Now Amy, reported that attack to the police, but the only thing that she was able to describe was like the make and model of the vehicle because with the headlights and the darkness, she never actually saw the people's faces. So the funny thing, I mean, not like funny haha, but the funny thing is Glenn Walker's testimony about that at the trial for Piper's kidnapping actually helped to solve that case. Back to the trial. So since Piper had been abducted from her home, the evidence of these tire poppers and the attacks on Larissa and Amy couldn't be used as evidence. <laughs> there was more than enough evidence with uh, between Piper's blood and hair and the torture board in the back of the Bronco. The jury was convinced. So after the three week trial, the jury deliberated for eight hours and found Robert Leroy Anderson guilty of kidnapping Piper Striley and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Well, what about that burial site that Glenn Walker led investigation? to Larissa Demansky. Well, when they got out to that burial site, it was indeed the body of Larissa or at least what was left of it. So this was Robert's first successful kidnapping rape murder. So he would often go back to where she was buried to relive things. He would take a handgun out there and shoot the burial site. It's a whole weird thing. Anyways, he also started to kind of grow nervous that Glenn would rat him out or that somebody would just find the body. So over time, Robert started like digging up and removing parts of Larissa's body that he thought could be used to like identify her, her skull, teeth, fingers, and uh, he would just throw them out his car window as he was driving along. So what investigators found in that shallow grave was like a scattering of bones, some clothing, duct tape, and some nine millimeter bullet casings. So meanwhile, when Robert arrived at the penitentiary to start serving his life sentence, he soon found himself with a cellmate that he confessed or bragged to. Robert said that he had dumped Piper's body into the Big Sioux River, which is why she was never found. He also said that he kept trophies from his victims, particularly jewelry items. Robert's celly squealed. The research is kind of conflicting. Like either he was trying to like cut a deal to improve his situation, or he was just so disgusted with the whole thing that he wanted to see Robert held accountable. Either way, police checked into the claims and they were true. So hidden strategically in Robert's childhood home was a heart-shaped necklace pendant that belonged to Larissa and Piper's wedding band. 
They also found that 9mm handgun that matched the bullet casings that were found in Larissa's grave and in Piper's driveway. So with that new information, later on September 4th, 1997, Robert was finally charged with the rape and murder of Piper Striley and the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Larissa Demansky. The prosecutors had all of that evidence that Robert Sully had given them uh, and they had Glenn Walker's testimony, who, by the way, did not have an immunity deal. In the spring of 1999, a jury convicted Robert Leroy Anderson of all the charges, and this time he was sentenced to death. After many failed appeals, Robert Leroy Anderson was found hanging in his cell and was pronounced dead on March 30th, 2003. Good riddance. Well, what about old loose lips Glenn Walker? Well, he was charged with conspiracy and accessory to all of the crimes, the kidnapping and murders of both Larissa Demansky and Piper Striley and the attempted kidnapping and attempted murder of Amy Anderson. Oh, I didn't mention that. Robert Anderson was charged with that as well, obviously. Glenn Walker actually entered into a plea agreement that uh, imposed 30 years in prison, and he served about half of that sentence before he was released on Christmas Eve of 2015 for good behavior. He claims to be sincerely remorseful and contrite and has offered apologies to each of the families of the victims. After his release, he moved out of South Dakota and has quietly disappeared back into society. And that, friends, is the story of Robert Leroy Anderson. <coughs> If you're interested to know any of the makeup that I used today that I don't talk about or show, just check down in the description box. Everything that is available will be linked. If you wanna recommend a crew crime story, then just look down in the description box because there's a link to a Google Doc where you can complete and share all of the terrible details. Thanks again to our sponsor, NordVPN. Make sure that you visit nordvpn.com goblin to check out the exclusive two-year deal, risk-free. It includes four months free and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! Have I had a booger in my nose the whole time? This place must have just been like, Murray, what? Kiev, Lucraine. Lucraine. Oh, it wasn't February. Murray. Get it together, get it together, get it together. Where is my contour brush? Come on, get it together. Murray, what is the deal, buddy? And shit, 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 shit. Why is this chair so squeaky?